Hello, hello. Welcome back. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> I'm Grace. And I'm Lydia. And of course, we're everything with the girls. So, this week we're going to do something a little different. We're going to read you our reviews because we're very excited. We have three whole reviews. Um, but we yeah. have five ratings. Yeah. If you're rating us and not giving us a review, come on. Come, go back and review us. Yes. So the first one is from Duncan Deal. Thank you, Duncan Deal, mystery man. <laughs> it says, I might be a tiny bit biased as my daughter is the co-presenter. Ooh. But this is well worth a listen. And it makes you think about famous situations, unsolved crimes and mysteries differently. It's so well put. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's my dad in case none of you realised. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the next one we have from Sarah Jane Granger. Shout out. Ooh. Hello. We're famous. Um, and she has said, as a true crime junkie, I love this. Grace and Lydia are so chill and easy to listen to. I love how they've introduced me to cases I've never heard of. Fabulous. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous, darling. And I may or may not have had to sit there and constantly badger my brother for this next review. You gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> because I know for a fact that he's been listening. So I adjust. Top of the review. <laughs> so can we just appreciate his tagline? Because I didn't actually know what he'd wrote until oh, yeah, he yeah. submitted it. So his tagline is a real time killer in lockdown and killer is in capital letters like go on <laughs> like he's really thought about this i appreciate it so he says love the show and keep coming back for more keep it up and keep the content coming <laughs> i love that thanks josh uh, you're not all bad i suppose i've been getting like excited recently though because we got over a hundred followers on Instagram now and we actually got yeah. a mention in someone's story that we didn't have to ask for and we didn't know them. Yeah, someone else who was it um messaged us. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, they messaged us saying they're really excited Jess. for the Ed Gein podcast. Yeah. So and hi Jess. We hope we both... you enjoyed the Ed Gein podcast. Yeah. Very exciting, very exciting. But yeah. yeah. So yeah. this week is gonna be a little bit different for us. We are we hope you enjoy it. Uh, we're going to talk about the disappearance of Corey McKeague. If you don't know who that is, he is an RAF gunner who went missing in 2016 around Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. So we're doing a disappearance, not a murder. Mm -hmm. Equally as interesting, but equally as... What's the phrase? You know, when you fin you know when we finish a podcast and you feel like deflated because it didn't even have a happy ending? Yeah. Yeah, this one's just it's as bad. just as bad. Yeah, because you don't because know what happened. It's a mystery. Yeah, maybe we can next week we can do one that actually does have a happy ending, and I've got a great <laughs> yeah, one in mind. I don't know if that's the point of our podcast. Though. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. But sometimes you got to break it up, haven't you? So Corey McKeague was born in Perth in September 1993, and he was raised in Fife, Scotland, following his parents' divorce. McKeag and his two brothers, Derek and McKeon. Sorry if mm -hmm. I'm butchering those, but they're like Scottish names. Um, were raised by their mother and attended St. Margaret's Primary School at St. Columba's High School in Dunfermline. McKeag joined the RAF Regiment in 2013 and was posted to Number 2 Squadron Royal Air Force Regiment based at RAF Honington after his initial regiment training at the same base. McKeague is a senior aircraft gunner and a medic on the squadron. So on the night of the 23rd of September 2016, McKeague was out drinking with his friends in Bury St Edmunds. He had driven himself to the town with the intention of leaving his car overnight and he separated from his friends in the early hours of the 24th of September. After leaving the Flex nightclub, uh, sorry, I hate the names of nightclubs. I just think they're terrible. Can I just, fun facts, Flex is where I fell over and chipped my coccyx. 
So one time I went out in various sermons and I fell over on the stuff. Flex has like, you know, the light up dance floor. Yeah. Anyway, I fell I fell like flat on my ass. Saved my drink, <laughs> which I think deserves a round of applause. But yeah, I chipped my cock sick. And that was how long ago was that? Over a year and a half ago now. 2019? Yeah. A year and a half ago now. And yeah. I still have to sit on a cushion. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got you a coccyx cushion for your birthday, shouldn't oh I? Oh my god, I literally had to go to like go to IKEA and buy the right kind of cushion to put on my chair on my desk. Oh my god. So the doorman of Flex recalls asking McKeague to leave because he was too drunk to stay. I mean, I've never had that before. <laughs> I've had that so many times. It's actually It's more that they ask they ask me to leave because you're too drunk to stay. <laughs> No, okay. Um, <laughs> not anymore. I don't know if it's not anymore because we've been in lockdown for the last year, if it's not anymore because now I've grown up a bit. But yeah, when we were 18, when we were at uni, I actually lost count of the number of times you had to carry me slash walk me home. Like physically um, carry you home. I'm I had actually to really lucky and that carry you, you up the fair. stairs once. I'm really lucky that you agreed to be my friend. So thanks. Like Claire and Duncan, if you're listening to this, I am who you have to thank for your daughter to be alive today. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Okay. So the bouncer remarked that McKeague was no trouble whatsoever and that they chatted afterwards on the street outside. McKeague was in the Mamma Mia's takeaway restaurant, reportedly his usual one, between quarter past one and half one that morning. The last known sighting of McGeek was on CCTV at 3.25 on Brent Govel Street, walking into the horseshoe area. I don't know what that area that is, Bury St Edmunds, but okay. Yeah, it's just an area in Bury St Edmunds. Yeah. Where there are a number of wheelie bins. Is that relevant? Are the wheelie bins relevant to the story? Yes, they are relevant. Okay. I just wasn't I wasn't sure if that was just a, a fun fact you threw in there. <laughs> no, they're relevant. Yeah. <laughs> there was no CCTV footage from him ever emerging, and the CCTV footage also suggested that McKeek had slept briefly in a doorway before waking up and moving on. I mean this guy has had he's gone walkabouts basically. Yeah. <laughs> like we all do silly stuff when we're drunk, but that is full on walkabouts it's not believed that he intended to walk back to his base RAF Honington which was 10 miles away Nicola Urquhart his mother said in a statement dated the 3rd of October 2016 which was released to the public and reported by the Evening Standard that her son had never walked back to Honington on any previous occasions and that leaving on his own, getting food, and sleeping for a short while were all things Corey had just had done in the past. So it wasn't uncommon for him to... That wasn't uncommon, but the idea of him planning to walk home was really uncommon. Like, 10 miles is a very long way. Especially when you're drunk as well. And also, if you remember, he drove in and parked his car there overnight, so if why wouldn't you have gone and slept in your car? Yeah, yeah. As he had the weekend off, McKeag was not reported missing until the 26th of September when he failed to report to work. Since he was reported missing, the Suffolk Lowland Search and Rescue Team had been involved with the police in searching the area around Bury St Edmunds and Honington alongside the RAF's own search and rescue teams, which have been bolstered by searches involving the police helicopters. Honington's like in the middle of nowhere as well so it's not even just he's got to walk down the dual carriageway in one direction to get there you know what I mean mean, like Suffolk in in itself is like how you would imagine like country bumpkins yeah yeah and then Honington is on the in the middle of that like in the middle single roads yeah yeah um on the morning of McKeague's disappearance, his Nokia Lumia phone had moved from Bury St Edmunds to Barton Mills, which is 12 miles to the north of Bury St Edmunds. Yeah. The phone data indicated that this journey took him 28 minutes, which is like impossible for him to have done on foot. Yeah. 
In October, Suffolk Constabulary seized a bin lorry, which um, was said to have contained his mobile phone, but the line of inquiry led to nothing. So when we're talking about the bin lorries, we're talking about the big, like, biffer bins, you know, that you mm-hmm. see, like, on the streets. Yeah, the um, dumpster. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that come and empty your bins, your wheelie bins, hence yeah. the wheelie bins. It was noted that the bin lorry seized was only carrying the weight of 15 kilograms. So they got this information from the guy that was driving the bin lorry. Yeah. He said, well, on that day, it was only carrying 15 kilograms. Mm-hmm. So it couldn't have been carrying McKee himself. This led to searches being carried out along the lorry's route between the two towns. The mobile phone was either switched off, ran out of battery or damaged, and it was never found. Yeah. One focus of the investigation has been whether or not someone gave a lift to McKeague as he was walking back to his base. His mother stated that Corey probably would have accepted a lift if it was offered to him, as he would offer a lift if he was driving himself and saw someone walking on their own. So he would have done it, so he probably would have accepted a, a lift. She also appealed for anyone who might have given him a lift to come forward, even if something untoward had happened. Police believe that McKeague was not in Bury St Edmunds. Superintendent Katie Elliott stated in an interview with Nicola Urquhart that there could have been a third party involved and that police can't rule anything out. The investigation also covered parts of the Hollow Road Industrial Estate in Bury St Edmunds and Great Livermere, which is a small village close to RAF Honington on McKee's supposed route back to the base. Along with the British Transport Police, the Suffolk Constabulary searched along railway lines in the area and some of the roads were also closed to enable thorough searches. Um, It is mad that he's literally disappeared into the He just disappeared off the face of the earth. Yeah. So in November 2016, it was revealed that in the two hours between 3 and 5 a.m. in the morning of the 24th of September... 39 people can be seen on CCTV going in to the Horseshoe area, which is where McKeague was last seen. Mm -hmm. So so despite repeated inquiries and appeals, 23 of these people could not be identified. And they even, like, one year, I think, they set up a 10 in, like, you know, every year you have, like, a town, a village fair or a village fair. Yeah. They set up a 10 in, like, the fair one year. Um, which was specifically dedicated with pictures of these CCTV, these people. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, if you if you recognise these people, if you know these people, come let us know. But they, that still didn't get anyone recognised. But this is the thing as well, like, they might not be from that area. They could just be there for a night out with their mates. Like, if, yeah, I, if yeah. I came to see you for the night, like... Yeah, you'd never go back. But it might not be that no one wants to come forward. It might just be that they're not there anymore. Like yeah. I, the fact that 23 people couldn't be identified, though, that's kind of where the theory of a third party get, comes in. Yeah. Yeah. So in February 2017, police started searching the landfill previously identified as being the last place his mobile phone was located when it was connected to a tower. This was in the brief that McKeague had slept in a bin in the horseshoe area and had been crushed to death by a bin lorry collecting the contents of the bin and transporting them to the landfill site. While Suffolk police stated that McKeague had gone and slept in a bin in the horseshoe area, his family said that they did not believe this version of events. If necessary, they said he would have gone and slept in his car, which is like what we said before. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's not as uncommon as you think it is for people to fall asleep in bins and die. No, it's not. Yeah, that it's does. Not. I mean, I don't know how what how often it happens in England, but I've definitely read some places that sometimes that's happened in America. Yeah, definitely, especially um, like homeless people and stuff. They go in but to escape the weather. The difference is that the people in America they get in those massive like restaurant bins, mm-hmm. and where McKeague has gone in Bury St Edmunds, it's like a, a residential area. So the the wheelie bins are like the typical wheelie bins you get in England. Yeah, they're they're like a two wheel rectangle bin. It's not a dumpster. Um, yeah, like you wouldn't get a comfortable night's sleep in a wheelie bin like that. No, you wouldn't. Like most people wouldn't even be able. To, if he's like over six foot at all, he won't be able mm. to fit in there. Like to lie no. down, especially. 
And even if he did, he'd have to lie on its side in order to lie down. Otherwise, he'd be upright the whole time. Because it is, it's like you could stand in it, but you can't bend down or lie down in one. Like So mm. even if the the idea was that, oh, they've emptied him into the lorry, the, the, the worker collecting the rubbish would have to lift it, like wheel it over to the... Yeah. That's so they can notice well. the weight of it. Them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. the weight of a wheelie bin, even when it's full of rubbish, will in no way compare to the weight of a wheelie bin if there's a human inside. Mm. So I'm sure they would have noticed that. Yeah. And even then, when they hook it up to the lorry, I'm pretty sure they open the lid themselves to then for it to then dump in. So mm. it doesn't really... Logic does not stand with that idea. So, on March the 1st, 2017, a 26-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of attempting to pervert the course of justice, which is lying to the police to um, prevent investigation going ahead, basically, if no one knew what that was. When it was discovered that the bin lorry first questioned was closer to the weight of 100 kilos rather than 15, which was originally believed. The man was later released and police stated that they believed he had genuinely made a mistake. Urquhart stated that this can really devastatingly mean only one thing. I mean, if you don't know what that one thing is, then (laughs) yeah, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? So the beast, the police basically thought maybe he's like mixed up his days or something. Yeah. The search was planned to cover 1,100 square yards to a depth of 25 feet and was expected to take 10 weeks. By May, they had shifted through 3,000 tons of waste. I would not want that job. <laughs> I know. And you're looking for a body as well. That's even worse. But also... Surely they would have checked the inside of the bin for forensics, for like blood and stuff. I don't, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Or like get search dogs or cadaver dogs to, I know there's, they could be questionable, well, there could be other waste with human blood on it or whatever, you know, like tissues and stuff, so that could be what they're picking up on. But hmm. at least it gives you an idea if there was ever anything in there. Yeah, I don't know. If, I guess uh, there must be a reason why they didn't, or maybe they yeah. didn't, it just doesn't say it anywhere. I mean, I don't think it's a big conspiracy or anything, but I just think it's just a bit strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the 21st of July, 2017, 20 weeks into the landfill, landfill search, Su- Detective Superintendent Katie Elliott announced at a press conference that the search of the landfill had come to an end with no positive results of McKeague. A human skull was found on the site in April 2017, but it was discovered to be female, dating back to 1945. That's mad. Isn't it? That's, that's crazy. How many other fucking skulls are there in my in my? Honestly, that's local crazy. Waste. Like, oh. 1945. And they, they just also didn't seem to care about finding out who that person was. Yeah. 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 I mean... How could they find out who it was? Because mm. you won't get DNA on it. Yeah, like, true. Dr. Stuart Hamilton, a forensic pathologist, stated that if McKeague's body had been in the bin lorry and was it was crushed, then the rate of decomposition would have been faster than a normal of a, for a human body. With the amount of waste on the site cross-contamination from it and other humans' DNA was also a strong possibility. So... Even then, you would it'd be hard to try and actually identify if it was him or not. Like, yeah, so maybe that's why they didn't. Yeah. In October 2017, Suffolk Police announced another search would be started at the landfill site, site at Milton in Cambridgeshire. A review of the investigation into McKee's disappearance by a specialist police unit in the Midlands, in the East Midlands, supports Suffolk Police theory that McKee climbed into a bin in the horseshoe area of Bury St Edmunds and was brought by bin lorry to the landfill site in Milton. Suffolk Police announced on the 26th of March 2018 that the search for the missing airman would be stood down as there were no realistic lines of inquiry. The day after this, McKee's mother and brother appeared on the Victoria Derbyshire show to highlight what they had cited as inconsistencies with the raw data referring to the weight carried in the bin lorry. 
McKee's mother stated that either the data was manipulated or someone was lying to the police. In April 2018, Corey's father Martin acknowledged that his son was probably dead and that he hoped to hold a memorial service in the summer of 2018 to help him and loved ones gain some closure. His father later released a statement on social media that said McKeag was in the Suffolk Waste Disposal System somewhere, but that his, res- that his remains are essentially irretrievable. I'm just not buying this whole bin lorry idea. I don't know, because I'm also not, this is just my opinion, not buying that it's some whole bigger conspiracy theory. No, I don't no, I don't think that either. So I don't know what I believe. But if they're basing it off the fact that the phone pinged off a tower which was going the route of the lorry, surely it makes more sense for something to have happened to him. Maybe like a mugging or something that's gone wrong. Mm. That so someone's disposed of his belongings and then taken him somewhere and disposed of him i don't know yeah but, because they've focused their searches very heavily on the waste sites they haven't yeah. looked really anywhere else yeah and it's like really surely sane. there's surely there's like i know there's no cctv of people walking in and out but have they not checked cars and things like that like mm. If there's traffic cameras and stuff going in and out of the area or whatever, and maybe like it's like one going in and then one going out around the same time or whatever, get the license plate of whoever it was and ask them, like go and see them and ask them if there was ever, they noticed anything. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. I just, this whole fascination of the bin lorry theory, I'm just not, I'm not buying it. Interesting. I just can't see a, a grown man lying in a wheelie bin basically the same size of what I've got in my garden and falling asleep no matter how drunk you are especially when his car's just down the road yeah it just doesn't make any sense yeah that is a good point the car and then the being car like oh well, good... he's probably drunk all right yeah. so if you're drunk and you know your car's there sure you're gonna want the comfort of the back seat to fall asleep in yeah definitely or why wouldn't you try and call one of your mates to try and come and pick you up or something? I don't yeah. know. Like, yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. But then I don't think it's just this, this big conspiracy either. I think there's just something else has happened and because this focus has been on the bin lorry theory that it's just being overlooked. Yeah, but it's like, I don't know. What else could have happened to him? He just disappeared off the face of the earth. Mm. So realistically, what other... What other um, explanation is there i mean there's a big canal in bury st edmunds isn't there or am i thinking of somewhere else i don't know that's a really good question that i don't know the answer to mm. i don't know don't know so let's go on to the theories because we know as i just said i'm not buying this bin th- bin lorry theory So retired senior Metropolitan Police Detective Colin Sutton went on record stating that McKeague's disappearance had not been intentional as making preparations always leaves a digital footprint. What does that mean? So if you're planning to leave, there would be a Google search or something that they would have found. Oh, so if he was planning on disappearing himself. Yeah, you you would be able to know. Yeah, okay. He would have taken all of his money out of a bank or something like that. Yeah, I know what you mean now, yeah. Sutton also stated that McKeague was shown walking into a cul-de-sac that was blocked off by a high wall and fence that and that there was no CCTV of him leaving. So have you checked the houses and residents of that cul-de-sac? Have they? I don't know. Have you they checked their wheelie bins for DNA? <laughs> Like, understand if they've checked their wheelie bins of DNA and they've found that his DNA is in one of them, then okay. But Can you imagine how fucking scared you'd be if they found your D- their DNA in your wheelie bin? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh my God, I didn't do anything, I swear. I promise there wasn't me. <laughs> Sutton stated that his guess was that there was another person or persons involved in McKeague's disappearance. Which, to be honest, I can see myself as well. Yeah. I don't know. 
What, do you think they, like, put him in a car and took him? Maybe, but it's like... He wasn't actually reported missing until two days later. Yeah. So it might have been yet another day for them to be checking all the CCTV and things like that and I think go that out I and question in residents. So that's three days that no one's watching or checking up or doing door-to-door or anything like that. A lot can happen in three days. Um, I think that is actually a thing. I, don't, I haven't written it in here, but I think... They only watched the next 24 hours of CCTV. Exactly. And they they might not have even gone in and searched any houses. Mm. Who's to say he wasn't in one of the houses for a good couple of weeks? Mm. Or whatever. Like, I don't know. Intendant, in, uh, intendant disappearance was put in doubt by Bakik's family as he was planning to meet up with his brother, Derek, on the night that he went missing, with the last text being sent at 3.08 a.m. He also had booked flights to go home for Halloween, and his mother stated there was three possible scenarios. That he was in an accident and was dead, that he left voluntarily, or that a third party was involved. And in December 2016, it was revealed that McKeague's bank account had not been touched since his disappearance. After the police stopped the landfill search in July 2017, Nicola Urquhart went on record to say that she did not agree with the version of offence being put forward by the police. They maintained that McKeague slept in a bin, which was then emptied into the truck and he was crushed and then either buried on the landfill or incinerated at Great Blakenham. Nicola points out that Corrie had been asleep in the doorway of the shop for nearly two hours. She finds it hard to believe that he would then go and sl- climb and sleep in a bin and min- maintains that the third party was involved. In October 2018, Suffolk Police revealed that they had analysed the data for the bin weight was carried, that was carried from Horseshoe area to the landfill site at Milton and it was normally between 20 and 30 kilos. During the period shown as January 2016 to February 2017, it was only nearly 100 kilos once that entire time, on the morning of the 24th of September 2016, when there was a load that was reported as being 116 kilos. It was determined that McKeague was inside of that bin that had been emptied. I mean, I get that it's weird. I fully understand that. But who's to say that someone hadn't disposed of him and put him in the bin? Yes. Know what I mean? Yes. I don't know, because I think maybe we're getting into the dangerous territory of where we want to make it into a bigger thing than it actually is because we love the drama. I don't know. I th- I think it's more that I just can't believe that someone would want to try and sleep in one of those bins. Yeah, I mean, they probably wouldn't. I mean, I don't know. I don't think I could even get into a wheelie bin. Unless you laid it down couldn't. flat. Unless you laid it down flat, but then I mean... But that's what I mean then. If if there's a wheelie bin on its side, the person collecting it is going to notice that. Do you know what I mean? And if they hadn't said, haven't said that to the police, oh yeah, I picked this one up and it was pretty heavy. I didn't look inside though. Then, yeah, yeah, you can be like, oh, actually, okay, that's something that you got to look into. But they never said that. Or it's not said that they ever said that. It is very fishy. But I think it's also strange. I don't know. It's hard because it's still an ongoing investigation, isn't it? And until you actually ever find out, I don't think... I mean, it's been five years now. I don't think we'll ever find out. Mm. But until you do, there's always going to be like all these different theories, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I just think it was too focused on that one area. Yeah, I wonder it's if to they say would that ever have they should be like, yeah, into it because it was, they, they clearly missed important things. Like, there was no evidence from any of my research that they searched the houses in the horseshoe area or the gardens yeah. or that they checked like the cars coming in and out or anything like that. So, yeah. I don't know. 
I wouldn't be surprised just... if they did an inquiry into how they investigated it. But it's also like, why would he go over to a residential area? That's a big mm. thing as well. Yeah, when his like, car was would... just there. Yeah. So did he know someone there or something? Yeah. I don't know. It's just... Anyway, it's a mystery. Um, it's very strange. But it is very interesting. So, yeah, if you are interested in that, keep reading about it because it's obviously... Uh, they're not actively investigating it anymore, but obviously they don't know what happened yet. So I'm sure on Reddit or wherever, there's still going to be stuff coming out about it. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah. So it's a nice like short this, one this week. Yeah, I mean it's a short one, but it's th- like thirty minutes. That's acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's only a short case, so yes, it is, and it's one of those like where we don't know what happens, so there's only so much we can talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you enjoyed this podcast or any of the other ones, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Everything with the Girls Pods. Um, and leave us a review. We'll give you a little shout out in the beginning. Um, we will indeed. And yeah, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Bye. Have a fantastic week. See you yes. later. See ya. Bye.